Welcome, welcome, welcome. Today on the podcast, we are riffing. Sarah, you want to give a brief rundown on the topics at hand? Absolutely. We've been a little quiet over here in the Mobile Bev Pros corporate office because a lot of things are not quite ready to release to the wild. One of which we're very excited about is the release of early bird tickets for our brew retreat, which is the business revitalization and empowerment workshop that we are hosting in Puerto Rico, January 12th through 15th of 2025 for 40 amazing business owners that are interested in coming to strategically plan for their 2025 using the proprietary framework that we rolled out last year. We received a ton of amazing feedback on it. But the one thing that we did here repeatedly was that people wanted to sit with the content for longer than five hours. And actually they requested multiple days and we're like, well, then why not just get together, sun, sand, and plant? And that inadvertently has become the tagline for the brew retreat, sun, sand, and a plan. So that is coming out. And in the process of doing all the work of planning, building out the website, the ticketing system, and all of that, we have also been simultaneously running all of our other programs. One of the things that keeps coming up within the accelerator is proposals and the concept of selling, marketing, and it's very clear in my head as to how this should look, but it's coming out in kind of broken pieces as I communicate to people, because it's so obvious to me that I didn't realize that there was a gap in communication and a gap in programming as to what I mean, for lack of a better term, I've been calling it kind of the pre-sale. By the time people get pricing, they've already sold themselves, in my opinion, if it's done correctly, right? They've already sold themselves. But that is obvious to me, not obvious to everybody. And so I, I forced myself to sit down and really dissect what I mean by pre-selling and having someone come in pre-sold so that it's a hell yes at this point. Like it's a formality for me to actually just get pricing because I already desperately want what you're selling. And so I did, I, I broke it down into a variety of different pieces and we've decided that we're going to host a, a free workshop in July on proposals, which is one piece of this, but a very needed piece. I think a lot of people struggle with what their proposal should look like, what it should have, how it should be laid out, what should it include how should things be organized and communicated? And you and I are really good at that. And so we're going to have an entire workshop just on creating powerful proposals. But there's some stuff that we need people to know going into that workshop. And so that's what we're going to talk about here. Yeah. And we're actually creating proposal templates so that we can give people real world examples of what proposals look like. And now the most delicious thing about this for me is that this is actually going to replace the current proposal system you have in the academy, because when you know better, you do better. Right. And so now that you have spent hundreds of years teaching <laughs> mobile bar owners, we have seen that there is a growing skill set required for these proposals. And that's something that we're going to convey and we're going to give good examples. So even right now, the current proposal that is in the academy is not at all how you're teaching this. And so we get to revolutionize another section of the academy with powerful proposals and examples and templates for people. And I'd imagine that the masterclass is probably going to be put into the academy as a new lesson because you've just learned so much over seeing hundreds and hundreds of proposals over the years. Yeah, absolutely. And so the webinar itself is going to be free. The proposal templates will be in the academy, but people who attend the webinar will get a look at exactly what it is that we're talking about. And we're going to describe why we put certain things in there, what we avoid, how we phrase things. The whole nine yards is going to go into the webinar itself. And you're right. When you know better, you do better. The proposal that's in there right now that I created years and years ago isn't wrong. It doesn't align with the premium experience that we have decided to really niche into. So if you're utilizing the proposal, which I would actually classify more as a brochure that 
is in the academy currently, there's nothing wrong with it. And it did a damn good job at creating multiple six figures in sales for my mobile bar. But it isn't what I would recommend for those that are specifically targeting a premium clientele. And it isn't sufficient for what I'm going to talk about today, which is really mastering the pre-sale so that by the time you're telling them how much it's going to cost, they're like, just take my card, whatever it is, <laughs> just take my card. Grab your paper, your notebook, your pen, whatever it is to take notes, because this is the only place this information currently lives. At one point, it'll likely become a module or a lesson within the academy, but right now it's raw and this is where it lives. So grab a pen. The first concept with pre-selling is confidence. And we've talked about this at length in a variety of different spaces and places, but having confidence in your offer is half the game. There's all sorts of examples of this in recent time, one of which, the Catch Me If You Can, it's a book. It's also a movie that Leonardo DiCaprio stars in. And it was based on a true story. And it is basically a, a confidence guy who went and, you know, stole lots of money and lived the life of luxury with no qualifications aside from the confidence, right? And you've even probably heard people come off and say a thing that was 100% wrong, and then they told you that they were just joking. And you're like, man, you just said it so confidently that I believed you. So confidence in your offer is so, so important because if you're not confident in your offer or in your pricing or in whatever, neither will they be, right? So having confidence, exuding love and excitement over what you're offering as a solution to the problem that they're presenting is half the game. And that confidence comes out in tone of voice and how you talk about it in messaging and how you present it on your website, all of those things. So start from the seat of confidence and we can move from there. And that also can inspire people. If they see you with a level of confidence in your offer that they don't currently have, oftentimes you'll find they rise to meet you there. A person being confident in who they are or in this particular realm in their offer can give people permission to walk as they truly are. Like their desires are valid, their viewpoints are valid. And so your confidence can inspire people to spend money with you, to be more of themselves with you, so on and so forth. Confidence, it's a game changer worldwide, not just in sales. Absolutely, absolutely. And if you're confident in this experience for them, their confidence in the experience for themselves it increases, right? And so that's what we want for people. So we start with confidence. And one of the things that kind of leads from the confidence to this next section is emotion. We want to evoke emotion in people, ideally positive emotions, but even negative emotions will do. And actually negative emotions do better. And we'll talk about that in a second, but emotional selling scientifically and statistically is wildly more successful in converting than logical selling. And so what you'll hear me say and have heard me say is get rid of all the bullet points that you have on your website, detailing cups and napkins and TABC or ABC certified bartenders. No, that's logic selling. Logic selling is unsuccessful when compared to emotional selling. What we want to sell is the dream, the experience, the version of themselves that doesn't question the value of this for their event, right? That's the version that we want to sell people. Emotional selling is very successful. So anytime you talk to a person, you put up an, an, an email or a, an Instagram post or whatever it is that you're sending out, I want you to ask yourself, what am I wanting people to feel when they consume this content? What, uh, what will this content evoke in people. And if it's nothing, if it's, I'm just communicating information, scrap it, don't even send it because emotional selling is what converts people. Logic is what people use to justify the decision that they've already made. So if they haven't already convinced themselves that they want what you have, presenting them with logic isn't going to get the job done. Also that emotional selling lands in the subconscious, right? Whereas logical selling lands in the conscious mind and your conscious power is a fraction of a fraction compared to your subconscious power. The subconscious is processing something like 4 billion bits of information per second. Like it knows how many specks of dust were on the floor when you walked into the room. The conscious mind is 
is like a thousand or something like super measly, you know what I mean? And so when you say that they already know whether or not they want it prior to making a logical decision, prior to like bringing it to the logical mind and like looking at the bullet points, okay, are they TABC certified? All of that comes later because the subconscious is really already decided. You're like an emotional ninja because that is so much more powerful and more profound than the conscious mind and it will override it. So even you could do a great job of selling something emotionally that logically doesn't make any sense. And if you do a good enough job of evoking emotion, they will buy it even if it's not logical. A hundred percent. That was the perfect segue to the next topic here. But before we transition, I want to mention that when it comes to emotional selling, there's two generic emotions, the good feelings and bad feelings. And we're in the business of evoking legacy and dreams in the premium space, right? We're demonstrating like, this is what's possible and look how yummy this is. And like, you want this delicious. It would be remiss if I didn't mention that triggering negative emotions is statistically more effective in getting people to take action than positive emotions. There is a word for this. I think I might've mentioned in a past episode. I can't seem to grasp it at the moment, but that's because our brain chemistry psychology is wired to prevent pain first and foremost, and then seek pleasure. So we're more likely to take action to prevent potential pain. And second, likely to promote pleasure. So both will work. I will say one is sexier than the other in what we do. If you were mitigating sinkholes or what's coming to my head is like housework, right? Where like maybe your basement will flood and we want to prevent that. Yes. Evoke all the fear because it is so much easier to prevent basement flooding than it is to remediate basement flooding. So for those businesses, evoking fear makes a ton of sense, but that's not really the space that we're in. And so when you are utilizing the don't get arrested because alcohol is a controlled substance and letting your uncle Joe 10 bar is potentially a liability for you, you're taking this either corporate person or this bride or person who's imagining an event where everyone's going to have fun and you're yanking them down into, oh shit, this is really risky. And so we try and avoid doing that in marketing, but it is effective. And so I felt like it should be mentioned. I sent a TikTok to the accelerator group where the creator, he's a South African man and he's just, I've fallen in love with him in like three TikToks. He had my whole heart. And he mentioned something along these lines. Now, the lady that he was coaching was a makeup artist. So similar vein, like she's going to be working for people for events and photos and things like that. And he was talking to her about not saying no in the sales process, which I know you're going to get to either in this podcast or in part two, three, four, we're going to get there because that's part of this pre-sale process. But he specifically mentioned for her, she said, people come in and they say, this this isn't in my budget. And he says, what do you tell them? If I come to you and I say, I have $420 and your price is 800 bucks, what do you say? And she said, no. And he was like, you never do that. And the example that he gave to evoke this negative emotion was a little more subtle than like your uncle Joe's going to get your entire wedding posse arrested. (laughs) The example that he gave was like, oh, well, on the biggest day of your life, potentially your ex is going to be there or your significant other ex is going to be there and they're going to see you. Don't you want them to see you? Or you're going to post pictures on social media and they're going to see you. Don't you want them to see you just beaming and like the best you've ever looked? And the lady's like, they're role-playing. She's like, yeah, I do. And he's like, well, here's the thing. My price is $800. You have $420. And My price is non-negotiable, but what I can do is I can help you find someone cheaper. And, you know, you might not look your very best that day, but you're going to look all right. You're going to look pretty good. And so what he did there was like, he was like the psychological trick, right? Where he's like, I'm going to help you find somebody. But then he called him cheaper. Then he said, "Uh, your ex might see you looking a hot mess on your big day. And so he invoked fear in a way that was inspiring and not in like a Because when I hear like, oh, your uncle's going to get everybody arrested. I'm like, oh, well, I just don't even want a bar at my wedding. (laughs) Now just forget the whole shebang. 
And so there are ways to do this that don't feel as icky sticky, but still make such an impact. Calling out that what that dude did in that process was hold her highest possible self in front of her and say, this is available to you if you're willing to invest in it. And we want that technique everywhere in this industry. We want you to hold the highest possible service that you can offer someone as being like, this is what's available to you. And you get to choose whether or not that vision, that dream is important enough to you to invest in. And no point do we come down, right? And it, it's not to say that you can't run promotions and like, but you run a promotion because that's exciting to you to run right? For whatever reason, you're celebrating a thing or we love fast action bonuses, like reward people for taking definitive action. Anyways, that's a, beside the point. But in that case, he demonstrated the gap. He pointed out the gap and that's super powerful. And it doesn't make people feel necessarily icky sticky. I watched the TikTok. He said, when you say no, it becomes an offense. And so immediately you're like, oh, and now we teach this as a part of the client experience. Either they say no because they can't afford you or they have gone in a different direction or the event is over. We want to transition them into relationship and advocacy. So if you tell someone who is so interested that they reached out, no, you've likely lost them for relationship or advocacy. So we, everybody is a potential relationship or advocate. We want to make sure that we're maintaining those conversations in a way that makes them raving fans, not offended. And so saying yes and, yes, however, I don't like but, yes, however, right? That increases your chances of one, you standing in your power and continuing to be like, this is what we can offer, but also transferring them to, well, not yet, not right now versus no. And Corbin Bacall talked about this in his most recent podcast with us. That's the podcast with Night Owl Coffee. He talked about creating future relationships by helping people find other options. And so a lot of people might feel like, oh, that's my competition. It's not your competition. If somebody can't afford your services, you get to maintain your seat of power while also having compassion and helping them find someone who is cheaper and use that language because it doesn't feel good in anybody's body to take the cheaper option. But also you're creating a relationship where someone can trust you and potentially in the future when they do have money they're like I love that experience so much that now I can afford night owl coffee at my event and I'm absolutely going to do that right and so he talked about that if you want to hear more about the seat of power Sarah you told the story here on the podcast of the people who didn't have you in their budget and they needed you to come down on price like three grand and you held that seat of power beautifully for them. And they ended up spending that money with you anyway. And I actually don't remember what episode it was that you told that story on. I can't remember the episode either, but just real quick, the story goes that I had spent like two weeks crafting this perfect proposal with all the things that they had decided was part of the bar experience that they wanted. We went back and forth via email a number of times. And then I sent them the invoice and they went silent. And so I followed up at one point and they're like, our budget is about three grand and this is coming in significantly over. Can you get it down to that? Because if so, we'll sign today. And I came back to them. I said, we can get you down to 3000. What that's going to look like is we're going to have to get rid of this. We're going to have to get rid of that. We're going to have to make this a little bit more simplistic, et cetera. And that'll get you under 3000. You'll still have a little bit more money in your budget to do other things with. Silence continues. And I think it was like a week later, I reached back out and just asked, you know, like, hey, how are you feeling about the adjustments with the proposal? Let me know, you know, if you want to make further edits. And they responded pretty quickly at that point. And they said, no, actually, we'd like to keep the original proposal and we would like to add on these additional services. So instead of whatever it was at the time, we now, instead of going down to the 3000, we went up. And that, that was an example of sitting in the power by reflecting back to them that, yes, we can accommodate your budget. But it also looks like making sacrifices in the experience that you're looking to have. But we had already showed them the experience that was possible for them. And the only thing that needed to happen was a few more dala dalas. That's it. And so is that, you know, like the wedding of your dreams worth a few dollar dollars? That was basically what we were trying to communicate to them. This is a psychological hack as well that we use in retail, but it's applicable online as well. 
when you are in the process of selling something, you want to put the experience in their hands. And so when you sent out that initial proposal, they had all these visions and dreams of what was possible. And then to give you the example, when you're in retail and you want to sell something, you put the something in their hands. So a lady comes in, she wants a curling iron. I take the top shelf curling iron, the very most expensive one we have. I put it in her hands. I have her hold it while I explain to her what this, the advantages of this curling iron and how well it's going to protect her hair and all this stuff. And then when she says, oh, I wasn't looking to spend $120 on a curling iron today, I take it away from her. And then I reach down to the bottom shelf. And I put a $50 or a $30 curling iron in her hand. And I say, well, this one will get the job done. It's not going to do any of the cool stuff I just told you, right? And so like when you put something in somebody's hand, when you give them a proposal and you show them what's possible, they now have ownership of that. They're like, this is mine. And then when you take it away, like we're like little children on the inside because you take it away and they're like, no, that was mine. Don't take it away from me. Right. And then 90 percent of the time, what we would find was that she wanted to invest in the hundred twenty dollar curling iron anyway, you know, especially when it was hers for a brief moment. And then I took it away from her and put some cheap other option in front of her. And that's kind of what you did. You were like, here's what's possible. And they were like, yes, we'll take it. And you're like, oh actually, if you want less, we'll do less. And they're like, less, less is gross. We want more. Absolutely that. And so we went on this riff because I wanted to reflect back that emotional selling can look both positive and negative. It can look like, you know, all the mushy gushy butterflies in the tummy. And it can also look like, oh, there's a void, right? There's like, I don't want the void. I'm uncomfortable with the less, right? And so you can sell from both sides. You had mentioned about emotional selling, triggering the subconscious because the emotions come subconsciously. And for anyone who doesn't know what I mean by that, it's like, you don't typically show up and be like, I'm going to be angry right now. And then you get angry, right? You're angry and your logic brain has to catch up and be like, what the fuck's happening here? And so when we emotionally sell, it's because you've triggered hope love, excitement, or other emotions, but you've triggered that. And then their logic brain has to be like, wait, why am I having that feeling? So how do we emotionally sell? Okay. That's the next point here that you segued so beautifully in when you brought up the subconscious, we emotionally sell through the senses. The senses have a direct hardwire to the subconscious. And your logic brain oftentimes has to be like, oh, I'm smelling a thing. What's that smell? Obviously we can't use smell most of the time when we're selling in this particular industry. But I use that as an example because senses have a direct line into the brain. So what senses do we have in this industry oftentimes? Every once in a while, you're going to be able to sell to somebody because they're standing in front of you. Maybe they're at a bar um, that you're doing for another event. Maybe you're doing a promotional event and they're able to taste and smell and touch your product. Beautiful. But for the most part, what we have is words, which is visual or audio. But in this case, most of the time it's visual. And auditory, if we get like multimedia on Instagram or, you know, TikTok, Facebook, those are multimedia, right? But visual triggers is what we have the most access to. Focusing on that, when we have exactly one sense that we have access to, we need to maximize the impact of that one sense. When it comes to visuals, what I often see, and this is both in proposals, this is on websites, this is in social media, we do a poor job of maximizing what's available to us through communication visually. Psychologically, and this is why when we talk about branding, we ask people to really identify colors that align with their brand, fonts that align with their brand imagery that aligns with their brand, because that's the language of communication for the subconscious. So if you're looking at like a New Times Roman and you're comparing that to like a brush comic sans, they're communicating two very different vibes, 
right? And so when you go willy-nilly without real dedication to your brand assets, you can communicate very different things just by using two very different fonts, right? So when we talk about visual imagery, we want to seep into all visual components of your brand. And it starts with color and font, but it doesn't end there. Yeah. And please make sure things are centered and aligned well <laughs> and that your font sizes make sense. Take a graphic design class on Canva. Like if you have a Canva subscription, even if you're in the free version of Canva, they have a series of trainings. You can just YouTube it. But if you're not great at graphic design, just spend a little bit of time on the front end getting better at that before you craft anything, whether you're doing your own website, you're creating brochures, pamphlets, proposals, because while your potential client may also not be a graphic design artiste, and so they are not consciously aware that like that's left of center and that the spacing doesn't make sense, subconsciously, they're encountering so much good branding all day long, okay? Like you're competing in a sea of marketing, not just with mobile bars, but these people see marketing everywhere, branding everywhere. And so something in them is going to trigger that like, why is that? Why does that look funny? And it's going to feel weird. And then potentially you lose a sale because you didn't leave as much margin at the bottom of that proposal as you did at the top. You know what I mean? I know that sounds like a small thing, but I'm telling you guys, it makes a huge difference. People are inundated with good branding. And so if your branding is shite, people are going to know. Yeah. And that's not to say... If you aren't a good brander, put nothing out because we get better by doing. So if the most that you can do is like just winging it and maybe you're, I, I posted something a couple of days ago that the spacing was all off, but I was on my phone when I posted it. And so I was like, whatever, I'm putting it up. And I posted it two years ago and the spacing was off there. And so <laughs> it's like, you know, better, do better. And so like, don't not post anything. Anything is better than nothing. But what we want to do is continue to get better utilizing the information that we're sharing because now you know better. <laughs> now you know better. So you can do a little bit better. And sometimes people can use poor graphics as an intentional decision. Not even poor graphics, but poor spelling. I think Bucky's was running billboards where they spelled words wrong or certain letters were upside down. Like that's intentional. It made people a little upset, but that became conversational, right? So like if it's intentional, then it's doing its job. But if it's unintentional, it makes it look sloppy. Like there's a lack of attention to detail. And we're in the premium space here, right? Again, Mobile Bev Pros is focusing on people who are in the premium space that are looking for premium clients. They're more discerning. And so they're going to subconsciously notice spelling errors. They're going to subconsciously notice spacing issues. They're going to subconsciously notice in- consistent brand presentation. So if you're using different colors, different fonts, different voice, they're going to notice even if they don't consciously notice. The next thing that I want to mention about using imagery and design to capture and attract potential clients is in the types of images that we use. One of the things that we know is that the brain loves faces and they love smiles. And a lot of times we see people creating websites, social media designs that focus heavily on their rigs or their bars or their cocktails. Not that those things aren't attractive and beautiful and people don't love seeing them. They do, but they love seeing faces even more. And so utilizing happy customers, or even if they're models and you've done a styled shoe on your website, like that hero image, like let it be a face. Let it be someone who is smiling, holding a cocktail, standing in front of your bar. Utilize imagery that triggers the subconscious to create intimacy and connections. Faces are a great way to do that. Also smiles, utilizing colors that are consistent with your brand colors whenever possible, and also using or capturing photos of almost like candids. People love when they feel like they're peeking behind the curtain or they're seeing motion or movement. So it's not necessarily a static, well-composed photo, but it's something that maybe someone is actively handing a drink to someone, or maybe no one's looking at the camera, but you're catching a glimpse of a moment where people are enjoying themselves. All of these things play a big part in using imagery and design to attract the subconscious into making an emotional decision before the logic brain even knows what's going on. 
selling psychology. We've seen hero images that work really well are actually videos. And so if that's available to you, like some really sexy, intentionally curated video in that hero image on like your website, obviously this isn't as possible with like a printed brochure because you can't print a video, but where you can use video can be really impactful. Totally off topic, but in Harry Potter, you have like moving images. And I feel like those days are hitting really close for us <laughs> between the AI goggles and the Google thing. I honestly believe that they'll have some sort of like coding in, involved. So when you look at a thing, the AI will actually just take motion. I think those days are coming. I'm still not convinced that technology isn't magic. No comment. No comment. <laughs> so the next thing that I want to point out when we're pre-selling to people is that people want to be seen, not sold to. So you can still sell with people, but we want them to be and feel seen, heard, and recognized through messaging and imagery. We want to reflect back to them the problem that they're having or that they know to be true. That's the best way to do it. So when we ask people to say, what problem are you solving? The reason we ask that question is so that in your messaging and in your pre-sale process, you can reflect that problem back to them along with how you solve it. And this is a silly example, but it's one that I'm going to give. If I'm looking for a dentist, but I have a ton of anxiety around dentists and I go to a webpage of a dentist, it's a picture of a woman who is smiling and she's looking off to the side and she has great teeth. And in the direction that she's looking, there's copy that says, the dentist chair can be a scary place to be, not with Sarah Dental. I'm sold. They've seen me, they've recognized the problem that I'm having, and they've addressed and called out the anxiety that I'm probably feeling in this moment. And so with the mobile bar space, we can do that by really understanding the problem that we uniquely solve for our ideal client. So one of the things that I pointed out with Bar Magnolia was that we make great event bars easy for hosts, event planners, and venues because the, our ideal client was looking for ease. That was it. That's the problem that we sold for people. And so we put that right there in front of people by reflecting back to them the problem that they wanted to be solved. So make people feel seen and make your ideal client feel seen above all else. That doesn't mean that you're going to be alienating people who aren't your ideal client necessarily, although you might, and that's okay. We want that. But we want people to feel seen with your messaging, not like you're being sold to. An example of what it looks like to be sold to in messaging is Bar Magnolia is the best mobile bar in Nashville book today. That's being sold to. The next thing that is important during the pre-sale process, and this will come as a surprise to absolutely no one, is the importance of social proof. People don't want to be the first people to invest in a thing. People are terrified inherently of the unknown, the untested, the untried. So People will look outside of themselves for validation that this is a worthy investment. This is a safe investment as much as possible. Think about how many times you rush to the Amazon review section before you buy anything. I sort. It's four stars or above for me. I don't even, anything else doesn't exist to me, right? And so the same is true when people are investing, especially at high dollar amounts, I won't buy anything for $8 off Amazon unless it's four or five stars. I'm certainly not going to spend multiple thousands of dollars with a bar company unless someone else out there has hired them and validated that they're trustworthy and a good investment. So whenever possible, utilize testimonials, case studies like link up to your Google reviews or your not reviews or whatever it is that you have, they should be legit, but testimonials, you're only going to put like the most glowing ones up, right? We know that they know that. And still the brain eats that up. They're like, oh my gosh, people are saying positive things that like, yes, the discerning part of the brain, the logic part of the brain really should go and do some additional research to make sure that the only thing that they look at isn't just the testimonials that are on that website, but the subconscious brain largely doesn't care. It just wants to see that someone has spoken positively about their experience with this particular company. So it's important to put testimonials on your website so that people know that you can be trusted and that other people have invested in your services. 
The other thing that's available for those of you who have a pool of testimonials, and Sarah, maybe also if you want to touch for the newbies on what to do if you have no testimonials, if this really is the first event, right? But for now, I'm going to offer that if you have a stockpile of testimonials, utilize testimonials that highlight what that client wants to feel. So as an example, right now I'm co-creating with Sarah the proposals that we're going to use for the masterclass, right? And for the lover archetype for the wedding, I'm using fake testimonials. I'm making them up because they're for templates, but I'm using testimonials that testify to amazing wedding experiences that speak to the lover archetype that use sensory language because a bride is in her most feeling and vulnerable state right whereas when we create the corporate one those testimonials are going to reflect professionalism ease of service how adept the mobile bar service is at what they do and when i do it for the magician or for the jester. I'm going to use fun testimonials, how amazing it was. It was so exciting. We loved it. I'm going to change, of course, the images, right? And so depending on how serious you are about this business, you can get really granular in that when you receive an inquiry for a corporate client, potentially you have a different proposal template, which you will if you're in the academy, to use for that than you did for the wedding. And you want to do the same thing with testimonials. Yes. I love that you pointed out that testimonials that highlight either what you're trying to communicate or are reflections of the type of client that you're trying to sell with whatever it is that you're trying to sell, make a big difference. You had mentioned maybe calling out, like, what do you do if you don't have any of those things yet? Chances are you have at some point worked with people that can speak very highly about traits that are important to people in the beginning. So if you have no testimonials whatsoever, the things that people are likely looking for are validation that you're trustworthy, that you're a professional, that you are a good communicator. There's certainly someone in your background, whether or not they were coworkers or family members, that can attest to those things honestly and legitimately. It doesn't necessarily have to be a past paid client, especially in the beginning, but we do want a third party to be saying things that are attributes someone that would be looking to hire you are looking for. I did this when I started coaching online, when I left my corporate career and I had my past store managers and past district managers that I had trained. I had them write testimonials as a testament to my leadership skills, to my ability to problem solve, to like mediation skills, right? And a lot of those were transferable because the women that I started supporting in coaching were professional women. They were entrepreneurs and they were concerned about business and also like personal development. And I already had all of that from the hundreds of store managers and district managers that I had trained just through a slightly different lens. And so I did put up testimonials. Now I have coaching client testimonials, but prior to that, I used past leaders. Yep, absolutely. The uh, The other thing here is if you can get a photo of them, like have them submit a photo as a part of this process, do that because people love seeing who it is like, oh, that's a real person. Now, the logic part of our brain absolutely 100% knows these testimonials could be made up and the image could have been generated with AI and still our subconscious brain is going to take it a little bit as a grain of truth. So it's better than having none. Yeah. And big companies actually do this because when you start getting into graphic design, you can really train the eye to recognize a stock photo when you see one. But most people don't, they're so inundated again with branding and stock photos that they don't know the difference. And so you know, oftentimes you'll see huge companies that have all these testimonials. They'll use a smiling image of a woman that is 110% a stock photo that I could find on Canva right now. And like, they don't even try to hide it. You know what I mean? And that's because the logic brain is literally just justifying with the emotional brain and that's it. So in order for them to give enough shits to go and look to see if that was a stock photo or not, their logic brain had to have been like, something about this feels wrong. Something about this feels like it's a little off. So the emotional brain was what triggered the sense, like I should probably go 
fact check this. If you love everything that you see on the page and your logic brain is literally just justifying it, they don't care. They're going to assume that this Susie person that gave it five stars is a real person. Now, do not use fake testimonials. That is not what I'm saying. But what we are saying is gather testimonials from friends, families, coworkers, past managers that speak to the transferable traits that you're bringing into the industry and get photos if and where possible and let the potential client decide whether or not that's sufficient or not. This has been an awesome episode. Next time we're going to do a part two and we're going to keep going because you have a list of things. Do you want to kind of just touch on the list and like tell us what's going to be in the next episodes? Yes. Okay. So things remaining on this list, which as a reminder, are concepts that we would really like people to have familiarity with prior to the masterclass on proposals. Because once you send a proposal, we want it to be a hell yes. It's literally just, you know, sealing the deal. They already have pre-sold themselves on making the decision. All they need to know now is how much money to send you, right? That's where we're at with the proposal. So all of this work that we're doing, all of this pre-selling that we're doing is what would happen before they even receive a proposal. I don't want people to think that sending the proposal is where we woo people into the hell yes. It is not. All of this pre-work has gone into having them convince themselves that they want whatever it is that you're selling. And so remaining topics that I want to talk about are future casting or setting of expectations. What happens once I say yes, right? We want to sell the dream. We want to build intimacy throughout this process. So people do business with people. How are we getting them to know who we are as a company, who we are as a team? How are we wooing them with our charming personality? We're going to talk about making the ask and inviting people to take action. We're going to talk about what to automate and what not to automate because I'm team automation, but not in all places and spaces, especially as we get to the premium sphere. We're going to talk about where brochures versus proposals come into play and what should be on both. And this gets a little rough because this industry is very inundated with the CRMs, HoneyBook and Dubsado. And I think one calls the thing brochure and one calls it a proposal, but they function very much in the same way. And I see brochures and proposals as being very different things. And you potentially should have both depending on the use case. So we're going to talk about that. And then lastly, what I might talk about is killing your pricing guide, your service selection sheet, and your rate guide all together. And that one might be a little uncomfortable for people, but we might talk about that. And I have two more here on the list, both of which are going to be covered in the Powerful Proposals Masterclass, but just a little preview here. We're going to talk about inviting them in to take action, and we'll talk about the, the importance and the power of selling a base package before trying to sell them the whole shebang. So yeah, that's a little bit about what's in store for those who stick around and listen to the podcast next week. And also keep an eye out. We will be sending out emails over the next week or so that give you the opportunity to sign up for early bird pricing when it is released for the brew retreat. This event has been structured very differently than past events. It also doesn't have a plethora of educators. We're working you through an annual planning process that we have designed that helps people clarify what they want to accomplish in 2025, actually generate action-based strategic plans and walks people through the conscious and subconscious things that you need to bring to the forefront in order to make change, right? Because we know that people as entrepreneurs have a lot of different things going on and it's very easy to fall into repeating the patterns. And then when you're like, I want to achieve new levels of success, there's no clarity as to how to get there, which what got you here isn't going to get you there. What changes do we need to make to get someone from one to the next? And so this particular retreat is very different than the types that we've done in the past. It's more intimate. There's only 40 seats at this one, whereas in the, the past, it's been 100 to 150. And if you're interested in learning more, 
those emails are coming out. And then obviously we'll continue to email more information around the Powerful Proposals Masterclass as we get closer to that. And I'll actually just link in the show notes the link for people to join the brew waitlist. The early bird is only going to be for the people that are on the brew waitlist. So I'll link that in the show notes so you can get on the waitlist to be included in those early bird specials. The other thing that I wanted to say was that brew is not necessarily mobile bar specific. The vast majority of our clientele are mobile bar owners. But if you have an entrepreneurial friend who also wants to sun sand and plan, then you can get them on the wait list or let them know that we're going to be running this. And then you can just email us hello at mobilebevpros.com. We can get you more information to get to your friends. So it is open-ended, only 40 seats. We do expect that they'll go pretty quickly because who doesn't want to go to Puerto Rico and plan their 2025. And so, yeah, we'll have that in the show notes. Email us if you have more questions and we'll see you guys on the next episode.